Hi, I'm Andy, and uh, in uh, this series of videos we're going to look at some versions of a game called Snake that I wrote in different languages. Uh, this time we're looking at the language Groovy. Uh, don't worry, I'll explain to you what Snake is if you don't know. Let's start off by just uh, having a look at the game uh, that I wrote, just really just to prove to you that I did write Snake in Groovy. So I launched my program. As we'll talk about later, one of the things with Groovy is you have to wait a little while once you've told it to launch before it comes up. We also have to wait a while for the fonts to load. First time I crash. But once we've done that, you can see that this is the game snake. You, you shoot around trying to pick up the apples and not crashing into your own tail, which I just did. So, that's the game. Let's have a look at the program in Groovy. So there's some imports at the top, look a bit like Java. Um, and you've got, we've got some classes that I've got here with constants in them. Then we've got a, a sort of real class with some member variables and a constructor. Uh, code, here's some methods defined with def. Uh, another class called snake panel. Um, this does stuff to do with drawing the user interface. Uh, this is the state of the game with the member variables for um, uh, different uh, objects in the game. We've also, a bit lower down, we've got some stuff to do with swing. So there's a quite a nice way of defining stuff in swing. Uh, in Groovy. So that's just to prove to you, I really wrote Snake in Groovy, just in case you were doubting me. Uh, okay, so we're going to look at... Uh, why write Snake uh, and why use Groovy? Um, we're going to look at some features of Groovy, which is, uh, include uh, the fact that it's like Java. It's like Java, but it's very dynamic. Um, it allows a lot of ways of expressing yourself, which are declarative, as in you just state the truth. You don't tell it what to do. You state what's true, and it works out the rest. Um, uh, and the use of closures in that particularly. Um, I'll show you a few of the more convenient features. Talk a little bit about one slight wrinkle, which is the, the, the code that lives in a kind of global scope. I'm going to scan past some other features, and then we'll be done. Okay, so first of all, why Snake? Well, mainly because Snake is a fun game, which I really like. It's a game that I've been uh, using to introduce myself to new programming languages for decades, um, because I like playing Snake. Well, well, I at least like writing Snake. Um, so it's an easy game to write, um, but it does require you to be able to deal with arrays, write loops, um, build a proper user interface, which often is something you, you're tempted not to explore until later in a new language, and deal with interacting with um, input from the user. Okay, so what is Groovy? Well, basically Groovy is a so-called scripting language uh, that's built on top of Java, on top of the Java virtual machine. So anywhere that you can um, run Java, you should be able to run um, Groovy code. What happens is um, the code gets compiled down to bytecode in the same way that um, Java code does, um, but it gets compiled when you run the program. So just like with a Python or a Ruby program, um, uh, you saw how I ran it. I just said Groovy and then the name of my Groovy program. What happens is, at that moment, it gets compiled into bytecode uh, and run on the JVM. So there's no separate compile step. But you can do a separate uh, compile step if you want to and pre-compile it. Uh, uh, and then it runs on the Java Virtual Machine. Uh, in your Groovy program, you can use uh, Java code. Uh, and Java code can call into your Groovy code. So it sits very, uh, nestles very closely in with Java code. Uh, the language itself uses lots of curly brackets and looks like looks a bit like Java. Okay, so let's start off by saying how it looks like Java. Um, well, all, almost all Java programs that you write will will be considered valid Groovy. So Groovy is like a superset of Java. Uh, also, you can use everything in the Java library. Um, if you're used to using the Java library, you can carry on using it if you write Groovy programs. Here's an example where we we imported the um, random uh, class, <coughs> and then we can use that um, and call rand.nextint on our instance of random 
just like you would in some Java code. Uh, but this is actually in Groovy. Uh, but unlike Java, uh, you're allowed and encouraged to um, uh, to be dynamic in in various senses, including in the sense that you don't need to bother saying what type a, a variable is. So, for example, the variable here, game, um, we know that it's going to be of type game with a capital G, um, but we can just say def. Um, we don't have to care what um, what the type is. Um, you can also do that for member variables like this grid size member variable of the game class. Um, and that basically, th those cases, basically what you're saying is something like what you would say in Java if you just declared that variable to be an object, uh, as in uh, it could be anything. <clears throat> in Groovy, I'm pretty sure that includes numbers, whereas in Java it's slightly more complicated. Um, you can also uh, declare a method or a, um, a free function using the, the def keyword, and that means I don't really care what I return. Um, you just... So again, it's like returning object, really. Um, you can also um, make these little blocks of code between curly brackets, and then use the as keyword to say that they implement an interface. So obviously an interface is a definition of what methods um, an object uh, provides. So this works particularly well in the case where the interface only has one method, then you can provide this little block of code and, uh, and say as runnable. Runnable only has one method uh, definition in, in that interface. So um, Groovy just knows that what you mean by that little block is take this block of code and use that as the body of the method um, defined in that runnable interface. And in fact, in this example that I've used, because uh, the constructor to thread takes in a runnable, we don't even need to say as runnable here. Uh, Groovy knows that's what you mean. So that's a really nice, concise uh, syntax for launching a new thread. Um, uh, a lot less code than if you were writing that in Java. That thing between curly brackets is a closure. We'll talk a bit more about them. Um, it also, if you're doing this with an interface that has more than one method in it, um, you can just pass in a map and then use as, blah. And the, uh, if the keys of the map are the correct method names, um, you'll get uh, an anonymous class to implement that interface too, so it is highly dynamic. Um, and actually, if you know anything about how you would do this in Java, you can technically do this in Java um, using proxy and so on. Um, uh, as far as I understand it, Groovy, under the covers, is basically doing the same thing uh, as you would do in Java if you were doing this. So there, c there definitely can be performance problems with um, um, uh, groovy code because we know that um, potentially writing code like this in Java is possible but sometimes it's slow. I know there have been improvements in the JVM which hopefully um, make this uh, this less of a performance problem. I haven't tried it out. Uh, okay, so uh, things you can do because of these uh, this extra flexibility you've got. You can write code in a more declarative way. So for example, this class at the top here, my stuff, um, it uh, can be treated like a like a bean in, in Java terminology. You can um, uh, you, you can declare the class like that, but actually it kind of gets a free constructor uh, made for it. So you can see that you can call this constructor and you can name the arguments to the constructor, and you'll end up um, building an instance of my stuff um, without having to write out that boring constructor that we write all the time, where we just assign all the um, all the members. All the fields, uh, uh, and also you'll see that it's um, from this get and int method. It's been actually it's had um, getters and setters are built for it as well automatically. So those come for free. You don't have to write them, and you can uh, get hold of them and set them using a set method. Uh, and also uh, uh, the example at the bottom there just shows that you can um, you can construct an instance of a class using this as keyword as well. So here um, we're constructing a color instance by just passing in a list of numbers uh, which are used as the as its constructor arguments. Um, presumably if it doesn't have a constructor that takes those arguments that will fail. Other things you can do in a much more declarative way um, uh, uh, it's just a good example of, of uh, what Groovy lets you do and that has been used quite nicely by the Groovy guys to make this thing called Swing Builder. Um, 
which is a way of defining what your user interface looks like. Um, uh, instead of building it up by saying, uh, make a new frame and then add this panel to it and then add this panel to it, so on and so on. Uh, instead of that, you, you write, um, uh, you sort of declare what it's going to look like in a kind of tree structure of method calls and passing in other, other methods, other method calls or the res results of other method calls to those method calls. So this frame method, um, you define a little bit about the frame in there, but then it, that also, um, that returns something that then gets past this other argument, which is this stuff in curly brackets, uh, which has a panel in it. Um, and you can have loads and loads of stuff nested inside each other just to say, this is a frame with a panel in it and there's a button on it and um, there's an image in the button and so on. Uh, just sort of define it as a kind of tree structure, uh, which I find a much nicer way of defining a user interface. Slightly reminds me of uh, Ruby shoes. Um, other things you can do, well, this looks a bit like JavaScript. You can provide a little bit of code um, for an event handler by just assigning it like this. And what that's actually doing is using, Im implicitly, I believe, is using the, the setter for the key pressed object. So it knows that the type of thing that, uh, that should be passed into that setter for key pressed um, is a, a particular interface, which is an event handling interface. And you're pr passing in the code that runs in the one method, the single method of the event handling interface. So basically you get to say key pressed equals and then the bit of code that should run when the key gets pressed, much easier to read than a lot of anonymous classes and interfaces all over the place. Uh, so really nice way of handling events. Um, you can define lists and maps using the square brackets, which is nice, a nice declarative um, way of saying not just uh, make me a new map, but also this is what Start, uh, what values are in that map. Um, if you're doing this in Java, you'd have to add them on one by one, uh, although I believe there are proposals in the new version of Java uh, to make this nicer. Um, so that's great. Only problem with it really is that um, the map syntax uses square brackets, whereas every other language that has a syntax for maps like this uses curly brackets. But that's um, they're constrained by the syntax that they're trying to continue supporting of Java. Um, other things you can do with closures, well, you um, uh, this snake body game dot snake body object is a list, um, and each list in Groovy has a load of methods available on it called things like each or each with index, and those methods take in a bit of code between curly brackets a closure, um, to, and so the each method runs that for each. Uh, element in snake body or in your list and it, it, there's a magic variable there called it um, so if you just pass in a block of code uh, which uses a variable called it to this each method each will set it to be the first thing in snake body then the second thing in snake body and so on all the way through um, but also with closures there's a syntax for naming your the the variables that are um, valid inside them which you can see underneath each with index um, the example there shows you that we've named the two arguments obj and i, so obj is going to be um, the thing in your list that you're iterating through, and i is going to be what number in the list it is. So that code will print out one comma and then the first object, and then two comma and the next object. Actually, I'm sure it will start with zero, not one. Um, there are other methods as well, like find and find all, lots of things. So basically you can provide a little block of code um, uh, and uh, as an argument to a method, and that method will do stuff. So um, that lets you do Ruby style loops here. Uh, and also, you can write your own code that looks like this. A uh, really nice way of working. Uh, once you've worked for a while with the idea that a block of code is something you can pass as an argument to a function, it then seems really weird when you're not allowed to do that in some languages. It opens up all kinds of possibilities of, of reusing code that you can't do without it. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, other things that you get in Groovy that are convenient and uh, potentially make your life easier. Uh, you can substitute into strings uh, by just saying dollar and then providing a bit of code to run and the, the return from that bit of code, the value of that bit of code gets substituted in. So here we're running this code game.snakebody.size um, and it gets stuck into the string. A bit worried about that syntax myself, but maybe it works. Uh, other things that are really good. Um, 
specifically in Swing, but uh, enabled by all these nice syntax things that you've got in Groovy. Um, in the Swing world, you often need to decide what thread you're going to do stuff on. So you can't block the event thread with something that's going to take a long time. So you can say do outside, which says start running this bit of code um, on a background thread. And then you can say do later, which means uh, I know I need to make this update to user interface, so I've got to be on the event thread. Um, so just switch into the uh, event thread, and when you've got time, do this thing. And then if you need to do something right now, um, and you can't proceed until it's been done, instead of do later, you can say EDT, which means uh, do this thing on the event thread. But hang around and wait until the event thread has actually kicked in and done it before we carry on executing the rest of our code. So those three um, uh, ways of working are really um, quite... It's hard work to work with them, but you need to do it a lot in a, in a Swing user interface. So potentially, um, this really makes your life, when writing Swing code, much easier. Other things that are convenient, uh, you're allowed trailing commas in most places, um, just commas at the ends of lists and lists of arguments and so on, it doesn't mind. Um, a little wrinkle that uh, we should definitely talk about, um, if you just start writing code in a Groovy program, you can immediately just write um, print, print hello or something like that. You don't need to be inside a class or a main method. And what, what Groovy does is just runs that code where it is. And, and under normal circumstances, you don't need to worry about what class that's in, you can just think of it as being outside anywhere. You can also have free functions, by the way, sitting in that place, which are useful. Um, so that's all fine, but you, you, when you do have to worry about it is when you want to, when you want other code to be able to see the stuff that you've defined in there. So I started off by trying to make some constants that were visible to all of my code. And in, in a Python program, if you make constants at the top, then all of your functions that come further down can see those constants and you can even modify them using the at global uh, declaration. Um, that doesn't doesn't work at all in Groovy, it's just the wrong way of thinking about it here. And actually the reason why is because magically underneath Groovy's making a, a class and, and putting all your stuff in there uh, and so the other classes can't automatically see it. They're not um, you're not in a lexical scope in that in that particular special situation the rest of the time you are um, so that stuff that you defined outside isn't really outside it's somewhere off to the side um, so if you want your constants to be visible you have to put them inside some kind of namespace class like it like this example of the key codes here so that's just a little wrinkle okay other things that you'll be interested in when you're working with groovy uh, there's a for in operator uh, you may want to use each instead of that but um, potentially uh, Depends what you're iterating through. Um, there is operator overloading. You can do meta programming because you can write code about code. Basically, as we've seen, you can pass code around. You can do stuff with it. Um, and you may also have seen in some of the examples, we often have missed out the dot when we're calling methods. Uh, actually, I may not have done that in my examples, but we certainly have missed out the around brackets. So you can call a function in Groovy by just writing the arguments after the function name. You don't necessarily need the brackets unless you need the grouping. So often when we were passing bits of code to something like each, uh, we were passing a block of code uh, by just putting it after the name of the method we wanted to call. Um, we didn't need the round brackets. That can make things um, look read a bit more nicely as in ex the example of the each method. It can also be confusing. Uh, for example, the frame method in Swing Builder, we called a method and that actually returns something that is itself a method and then the argument, the curly bracket thing got passed to that thing and that wasn't necessarily clear that that was happening. But perhaps you don't need it to be clear because that's the point of it. I don't know. Um, you can also do currying which means pro pass, provide some of the arguments to a function and then pass that thing around, that kind of partially applied function around and later on provide the other arguments where it actually, then it actually gets evaluated. Um, there are domain-specific languages for XML and JSON and probably other things um, that make it easy to construct XML and JSON structures in a nice-looking way in your code. Uh, you can also use mixings. You can get uh, grab bits of code and reuse them in another class without having to use inheritance and locking things together. Uh, and that's it. So that was uh, Snake 
in Groovy. Um, Groovy seems pretty groovy. Um, if you are, if you feel that you're constrained by the world of Java and you want to express yourself um, in, with less typing and with higher level concepts um, like um, closures and um, passing bits of code to, to into functions and doing stuff with them, uh, Groovy might might kind of free you from that jail of um, single paradigm Java. Um, on the other hand, there does seem to be a significant performance cost uh, for doing that, so uh, you'd have to use it all judiciously. Um, I'm hoping I'll continue the series with uh, Snake written in lots of other languages. Leave a comment if there's a particular language you'd like me to have a look at. Um, and see you next time.